Hello everyone, this is Rick and welcome to Astro Club. This is Beetlejuice Goes Supernova. Before I get into it, just want to mention Patreon. If you'd like to support the work of Astral Club, you can do so uh, on Patreon. Uh, when you become a patron, you get advanced episodes on Sunday, a library of downloaded episodes that you can put on your podcast app, and of course, a Patreon email where we can talk back and forth and we can ask questions. Also, private lessons. If you'd like a, a private lesson to learn how to astral project, you're more than glad to send you that information. Uh, you'll find the link to Patreon and the email for private lessons in the description. I had decided to go several hundred years into the future just to do some scouting and see what I could uh, find. It's been a while since I just did a, a pure, what I consider short-term time jump. You know, a couple hundred years is, I consider it to be a uh, relatively short uh, term. So I launch myself in the sky, and what I normally do is I concentrate on my target. And I usually begin a type of counting mechanism uh, depending on how far I want to jump, say 200 years, I might, I might start by counting by tens, let's say, years-wise. And when I start doing that and I fly fast enough, if I do everything right, usually a time rift will open up and then I will then will myself into that time rift. As you know, and I've discussed this in the past, Generally, I lose consciousness pretty shortly thereafter. And then if I'm lucky, when I regain consciousness, I end up in that time period. Of course, it could be anywhere. It could be hovering over the earth. It could be <laughs> in the ocean or a body of water. It could be in a desert or a farmer's field. Uh, it, it's, it's, always, uh, it's always a surprise uh, where I end up. But... You know, I think I've gotten better at getting my time goals down. Now, generally, when I go into that time rift, I'm very, I'm very much concentrating on my goal to the exclusion of all else until I lose consciousness. Well, I had just gone into this time rift when I felt, and I, I, I guess maybe I lost my concentration for a second, and I felt this excitement. And instead of ignoring it and concentrating on where I was going, I decided to stop and break out of the time rift, something that I've rarely done before. And when I did, I found myself in a future. I'm not exactly sure what time it was because it wasn't my original goal and it was before I lost consciousness so I think it was probably definitely within geez it's hard to say 25 to 50 years somewhere definitely within that time frame it could be sooner it could be a little bit later but I think somewhere around there but of course I can't be sure because it kind of broke my process to check out what was going on. And the excitement I sensed was a lot stronger once I got out of the time stream. And it was, it was as if the entire world was united for a period of time. And you could tell why pretty quickly, because if you looked up into the sky and it was, uh, it was daytime, there was another sun in the sky, you might say. Uh, and by doing a light scan of some of the people in uh, the area, I could tell that Beetlejuice had gone supernova. For those who aren't aware of the word um, Beetlejuice, it is a red supergiant star. It's located in one of the shoulders of the constellation of Orion, for those who are fans of uh, astronomy and 
and constellations. It's, um, it's approximately 10 million years old, although when I did my research after my projection, uh, it, I got a lot of information that was all over the place. Some information claims it's eight to eight and a half million. Others say it's 10 million years old. But everybody agrees it's going to be ending in a supernova explosion. Now, when I saw it, and I will continue with, with what I saw in a minute. When I saw it, I thought to myself, the last time I read something about Betelgeuse, and I was trying to gather up that information, uh, I heard the scientists say that it would probably explode sometime within 100,000 years from now, and that... Uh, it was highly unlikely that we would see it in our lifetime. So I pretty much just checked it off as one of those interesting things that uh, we here today will never get a chance to see. But here it is, this bright object, which uh, seemed like a second smaller sun in the sky. Uh, now, this star is so massive that if we... Uh, magically placed it at the center of our solar system, it would take up the orbit of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And some sources that I came across said possibly even out to the Jupiter orbit. But once again, there seems to be a, a lot of information that uh, isn't exactly super exact and there's differing opinions. But everybody agrees it's very big. <laughs> now, supernovas, uh, if they happen close to Earth, as uh, I found in my research, they do about every 240 million years on average. They can cause mass extinctions. Luckily for Earth, however, Betelgeuse, or Alpha Orionis, is around 640 light years from Earth. Although, uh, differing sources had it anywhere from 548 light years to 1,000 light years away from Earth. So, once again, the important part is, is it's way far enough away that we won't be in any danger. But we will get one heck of a light show. Now, Orion is usually the 10th brightest star in the sky. But uh, I read in the last few months, it has increased in luminosity about 142%. So scientists are now saying that we could conceivably see uh, Betelgeuse in a supernova from Earth within the lifetimes of people alive today, which is uh, a change than uh, over the last article that I read a few uh, years ago, I believe it was. At any rate, here I am looking up in the sky, and I, I, I flew up further uh, to uh, orbit the Earth, and sure enough, uh, what you had was this point of light in the center that was casting forth this giant luminosity. Uh, and it could be seen even during the day. I progressed a little bit into the night. And there it was. It was uh, uh, about as bright as the moon. Definitely a half moon, but perhaps even a full moon. It's tough to, tough to gauge exactly. But it was bright. Uh, there was a lot of excitement because this thing could be seen in the day and the night. And everyone around the world was interested uh, in, in all the social media. Uh, people were, were talking about it. It was you know, on the, te the television. Uh, it, was, it was just this extraordinary event. There were people who started having uh, what's called supernova parties. And uh, I think they were doing this at the peak of its, of its brightness. And I got the feeling that, that people could see this for a number of months. Um, it, was, it was visible for a number of months. Now, it got brighter, and then it ended up getting dimmer and dimmer. But for a number of months, 
people actually could see this thing day and night. And they were having these parties. Uh, and uh, they were, it was quite popular. People were outside because by the light of the, uh, of the supernova, in addition to whatever phase the moon happened to be in, it was light enough to have a party outside. And you didn't need to have uh, uh, lights uh, on to have the party. Although I saw one party where they had like these fairy lights kind of thing. Um, just, I think, just to add some ambiance to the whole party. But people would stay up all night uh, having these parties to celebrate the, uh, the supernova. It was quite the event in, uh, in human history. Uh, so it was, uh, it was very exciting and I, I felt the oneness, the, the, uh, the wonderful connection that people had because this was something that was happening to everyone and it, it caused everyone to set aside their, their everyday cares for a bit and, uh, and look up at the sky. Now, from an astronomer standpoint, I'm sure it wasn't a lot of fun because a permanent point of bright light in the sky. And I, and I want to reiterate this again. It didn't look like literally our sun, like, like another sun. It didn't look literally as big as the moon is in the sky. It was a, it was a point of light, but surrounding that point was this huge halo surrounding it of luminosity, which was as bright as uh, the moon and could be seen in the daytime. So it was a very odd, very odd object and people were very excited about it. And it seemed like for that period of time, people became more unified. But like I said, the astronomers probably had a harder time because that type of light is not great for and uh, doing some deep uh, astronomy because it washes out the light of a lot of other surrounding uh, stars and and what have you. But uh, I stayed there for a bit, but it's just because the excitement was a little intoxicating and I got a chance to see uh, Betelgeuse in, in its supernova phase. And I don't know whether I'll live in this lifetime to see it, but at least I got a chance to see it uh, in this future period of time in the astral, which uh, I believe is a lot closer than perhaps some scientists think it is. Anyway, I wanted to share that with you um, because I ended up being pulled back into my body, so I never got to my destination, but I don't regret it. I think it was uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, hopefully, some of you folks listening to this will actually get to see it yourself uh, and have yourself a supernova party. And if I'm not around at that point, please think about Rick when you have your supernova party. Uh, if you liked this, please hit the like button, share it with those of like minds. Subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure that bell is solid so that uh, Saturday morning and Wednesday afternoon you'll be alerted as to the new episodes. And uh, please, uh, I'm open to questions and comments. What do you think? What are your theories? What, uh, any ideas you have? Do you th think you'll have a supernova party? Uh, whatever you want to say, I'd be interested in hearing about it. Or if you're an astronomer or amateur astronomer, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. At any rate, uh, this is Rick, and I will see you on the astral plane.